You like podcasts, right? Me too. Thanks for listening, by the way. Before we get started today, I wanted to tell you about the podcast Scary Time. The show features a new independent creator every single week. Whether you're looking for variety or want to discover your next binge-worthy scary podcast, you'll love Scary Time by Indie Drop-In Network. Prepare yourself for the scariest and creepiest stories from the best independent creators. Ghosts, creatures, freaky places, weird experiences, aliens, haunted objects and so much more. Download Scary Time on Apple Podcasts today and get ready for a fright you wouldn't want to miss. This episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. Summer is finally here. It's been a long time coming and it's finally here. Give your brain a well-deserved dose of refreshment all year long with the mobile puzzle game Best Fiends. It's a casual game so it doesn't stress you out, which is a good thing right now. You don't need internet to play the game, so if you don't have Wi-Fi, that's no problem. You can play anytime, anywhere. The great thing about it is that it doesn't actually take up much of your time, but it does fill up those moments where you wish you had something to do. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. This podcast contains some strong themes which are not for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. As the evening wore on, some of Martine's friends began to feel tired and at around 2am decided to go back to their flats. Martine wasn't ready to go home just yet and wanted to stay out and have more fun. CCTV shows Martine and Farouk leaving the club together at between 2 and 3 a.m., getting into a taxi to apparently go to another nightclub. At that point, they were no more than a mile from the basement where a horrific discovery would be made just two days later. This is Red Rum, a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Episode 33, Martine Vic Magnusson. Martine Vic Magnusson was born in the early hours of a cold winter's day on the 6th of February 1985 to Christine and Odd Petter Magnusson. This was after a high-speed road trip to the local hospital. Kristen's contractions were so regular and close together that Obpeta was worried that his wife would give birth on the journey to the hospital. So he broke the speed limit and drove through a roadblock that had been set up because of an accident on the motorway. He arrived at the hospital with minutes to spare. Martine was born three minutes after they arrived the second child of the Magnusson family. After the successful birth, the three returned to their home in Nasoya to be greeted by her brother, Magnus, and her grandmother, who welcomed her with open arms. Nasoya, a small island in the region of Aska, is known locally for its celebrity and financial sector residents and the wealth that brings to the region. It is linked to the mainland by a bridge. Much of the island to the east is a beautiful nature reserve. Aska is part of the greater Oslo region and is named after the old Aska farm. Aska being the plural form of ask, which means ash tree in Norwegian. The coat of arms for Aska, created in 1975, shows three silver-coloured tree trunks. The trees are ashes which used to be cropped every year to provide food for the animals, so the trees developed a particular shape over time to become characteristic of the area. As well as a fantastic environment for outdoor pursuits, the region has become an affluent suburb of Oslo, 
being the second wealthiest municipality in Norway and counts amongst its residents Crown Prince Hakin of Norway and his family. Nesuya was a wonderful place for a child to grow up, with plenty of activities throughout the year. The Magnussons were a successful family, with Odd Petter working as an IT marketing manager, whilst also running a small family business making ski sledges. He was following after his father, who had patented his invention of a transport sled, which could be dropped from an aircraft to help people on ground in snowy environments. Martine and her friends enjoyed playing in the sandbox, climbing trees, building doll's houses, and in the winter, snowmen, and swimming by the pier during the summer. The children in the neighbourhood tended to know each other and spent hours playing together, so Martine grew into a sociable and very active person, constantly needing to be on the move and experiencing new things. She dreamed of becoming prima ballerina and practiced and practiced. But after a good few years of learning and training, she realized that her dream was actually seemingly unattainable. And so always mature for her age, she found a new passion. This time, handball. Martine soon became the top scorer on her team. As time went on, Martine also found great joy in horses and horseback riding. The idyllic childhood continued. The Magnussons had a third child, so Martine now had a younger sister as well, Matilda. The pair were friends as much as they were sisters. They loved doing things together and chatting about their latest experiences. They enjoyed wonderful summer holidays at their grandparents, and in 1998, the entire family went on a round-the-world trip where Martine began to develop an appetite for travel and different cultures. As the three children grew up together, they became increasingly close and relied on each other for friendship and fun. Martine was the most extroverted of the three, always making the other children and her parents laugh with her clowning and joking around. Her father describes her as someone who could, quote, lift any sort of atmosphere, she was pure sunshine. A close friend described her as, quote, so funny all the time. She always made people laugh. She was so happy. Everyone liked her. She was always letting me know what she thought. She was honest. You could trust her. She was gentle and generous. Everyone seemed to like her and she had the ability to make others feel special by chatting about their interests and hobbies and had what Norwegians describe as an inner light that shines from you, unquote. She developed warm and intense friendships with those around her. Martine had blonde hair and hazel green eyes. She stood at around five feet four inches and was described by those who knew her as beautiful. While she was popular and seemed to get on with both girls and boys, she never had a serious romantic relationship. She often threw dinner parties in the beach hut her family owned and often used these occasions as a chance to show off her culinary skills, making recipes her mother had taught her. Everyone loved her chocolate brownie cakes. She was particularly close to her grandmother who had welcomed her with open arms when she arrived home from hospital after she was born and that close relationship continued the older she became. After leaving primary school in Nasoya, Martine started at the same high school as her brother Magnus, the Christian gymnasium in Oslo, a Christian selective private school that would provide three years of college preparatory studies at high school level and offered advanced courses in sciences, languages and social sciences. This was alongside compulsory religion or Bible study. Martine's parents chose to send her there because they knew students consistently scored highest amongst all private Norwegian schools. The school was also known for its annual fundraising projects. One year, over 300,000 US dollars were raised for a project in Ethiopia. It was here that Martine also began working on a project of interest to her personally, one that would bring her close to her grandfather on her father's side who she had never met. Martine's grandfather, Odd Magnus Magnusson, was a war hero 
and had been a member of the Norwegian underground during the Second World War, part of the Norwegian people's resistance to Hitler's drive to destroy British forces. He was captured by the Gestapo in 1940 and spent the next five years in three German-run prisons in Norway and two concentration camps in northern Germany. During this time, the Nazis tried to break their prisoners through their inhumane treatment and the Norwegian prisoners developed techniques to build their mental strength and survive the ordeal. Throughout his imprisonment, Odd Magnus secretly kept notes, made sketches and drawings of Nazi leaders, guards, prisoners of war, cells, barracks, and work details which he hid in his ceiling light fixtures. These were retrieved after the war. His last job at Sachsenhausen one of the five notorious Nazi concentration camps, was as a draftsman for an underground operations centre. Despite his cruel treatment, Odd Magnus survived his ordeal by using the techniques he and the other prisoners had developed for survival, and on release at the end of the war, wrote a memoir, V. Ventet, We Are Waiting, based on his experiences. Intriguingly, in 1946, in New York City, a man called Corey Bolgen received a copy of Viventet by an author named Lars II as a Christmas present. Corey, who had emigrated to the US from Norway in the 1930s, was confused. He didn't know anyone called Lars II. Corey investigated through his family in Norway until he discovered the memoir had been written by his childhood friend, Odd Magnus Magnusson who he had lost contact with after leaving Norway. Lars too was Odd Magnus's prisoner of war name. Corey translated Viventet soon after receiving it, but did nothing with it and it lay dormant amongst his papers until after his death in 2005. His wife discovered it as she was going through his things following his death, and the manuscript was then meticulously edited and published posthumously as... The Long Norwegian Night. It is still available today. Quote, When life is challenged, a wider spectre of human characteristics and values often surface in people. Being reminded that universal values should not be taken for granted but are something to stand up for, and when threatened, is a focus that would also improve everyday life today. We who live 75 years later are inspired by his discipline, humour, ingenuity and commitment to his friends in prison, his family and his country. Unquote. As Martine discovered more about her grandfather, she involved herself in project work on his book and visited Sachsenhausen in Germany where her grandfather had managed to survive as a prisoner of war. At the same time, She worked part-time as a cleaner and then, in 2004, began working at a number of clothing outlets near her parents' home. She was working at a Spanish clothing store in Oslo, and she was good at it. A former customer said, quote, Having forgotten my wife's birthday a couple of years ago, I had to run into the woman's clothing shop of Ginny in Oslo to buy a last-minute birthday gift. Downstairs, I was quickly taken care of by a bright and cheerful saleswoman. Fifteen minutes later, I left the store, enjoying that a rainy and hectic summer day had been transformed into pure sunshine. Unquote. As far as a full-time career was concerned, Martine initially had an ambition to go to medical school, but didn't achieve the grades she needed. She was determined to continue studying and working hard, so that eventually she would be able to improve her grades and move on. She prepared for her new career by working in care and nursing homes locally, and in autumn 2006, Martine enrolled at the Warsaw Medical University in Poland. Martine packed up her belongings and went to live in Warsaw. She found that although she did love the city and the experience of living in a different country, after a few months... She came to the realisation that medicine was not for her and decided to return home. After a while considering her options, Martine decided she needed a change, which included international travel to follow many of her friends and move to the UK for a period. She wanted to do a business degree 
and wanted to be in London because of its diverse population and her interest in meeting people from different backgrounds. London is well known for being a vibrant place for younger people to live the early part of their lives, and as well as a cultural and historic centre, it offers great nightlife. Martine would enjoy all its many aspects, and so she enrolled at Regent's Business School in Regent's Park to study international business relations starting in September of 2007. The Regent's Business School was founded in 1997 as a private business school, part of Regent's University London. Martine moved into a lively, thriving shared accommodation block she rented with a number of other students, and she built close friendships with them. They even had a rule designed to ensure the safety of the women who lived in the flat. If you were going to be out all night, just make sure you text to let us know that you're safe. Martine became popular with her fellow classmates and they would often go out in the evenings, visiting nightclubs, theatres and bars. She loved to have fun but was also a hard-working student and took her studies very seriously. In the same class as her at business school was a shy and friendly young man called Farouk Abdullah. He was described by his fellow students as someone who seemed, quote, very nice who wouldn't hurt a fly. If he scratched your car by mistake, he was the sort of person who would leave his name. Martine seemed to get on well with Farouk. They became good friends, talking all the time on the social networking site MSN and through BlackBerry messaging, both popular back in 2008. They also connected on Facebook and spent an increasing amount of time together. Martine described Farouk as, quote, such a nice guy, he's so funny. The other students on the course thought that Farouk had a crush on Martine, but importantly, her friends maintain Martine and Farouk were never romantically involved, at least as far as Martine was concerned. She was still that young woman who had never had a serious long-term boyfriend and seemed to want to keep it that way, unless the right person came along. Farouk was the son of a Yemen-based billionaire business entrepreneur called Shahir Abdullah. The Shahir Trading Company Limited, founded by Farouk's father, was a trading and industrial group regionally based in Yemen and carried out a wide range of activities and interests in a variety of countries in the Middle East and Africa. The group's chairman, Farouk's father, founded the company in 1963 to trade in soft commodities. By the mid-70s, the Shahir trading activities included petroleum, tourism and property. Shahir was known as the King of Sugar in Yemen and held considerable political influence. However, he was known to be extremely shy of the media and would never give interviews or discuss his business publicly. It was not until December 2009 that a picture of him was published in the Norwegian newspaper VG. As a child, Farouk attended the Azal Hadda Primary School in Yemen before spending a considerable amount of time as a resident in the UK, learning and living at a number of different... Later, he would also spend time in the US and eventually gained a US passport. Due to the wealth of his family... Whilst at the Regent's Business School, he was able to rent a £600 a week flat in Great Portland Street, right in the centre of London, with excellent access to the city. He enjoyed the social life and all the partying that London provided, and although coming from a strict Islamic background, he drank, smoked, and described himself as agnostic, leading his father to caution him that he should stop the partying and start to get serious with his studies, because he needed to be prepared to take over the business. Meanwhile, he began studying alongside his party lifestyle and formed a solid friendship with Martine. Martine also enjoyed London's nightlife and was known as a quote party girl after she was papped attending the most fashionable international London nightclubs. In reality, however, although Martine did like to go out with her friends, She was not necessarily a, quote, party girl. 
She was careful with money and supported herself with part-time jobs. She had no problem working hard and would juggle working in clothes shops and working hard on her studies. She was also known to be streetwise and was always careful about going out at night. She would always stick to the rule of texting her housemates to let them know if she was staying out for the night. On Thursday the 13th of March 2008, it was the end of term at the Regent's Business School, so Martine and her fellow students wanted to celebrate. Martine had achieved top place in her studies, with the highest marks for the exams that year. She and a group of her friends from class decided to celebrate by going out that evening to an exclusive nightclub called Maddox in the heart of London's Mayfair. The Maddox Club describes itself as, quote, a private members club in the heart of Mayfair that has offered London a boutique sanctuary in which to party since 2007. Maddox Club has firmly built a loyal base of discerning late-night partygoers who gravitate to the elusive and seen-but-not-heard green room, accessible and pardoned by certain Maddox Club personalities, unquote. The club was frequented by the rich and famous and is still today seen as one of London's most exclusive places to party, attracting everyone from Pharrell Williams to Kira Knightley. It was also an expensive place to go for a celebration. Farouk was amongst the group of friends who went out to celebrate with Martine. Pictures taken at the club during the evening show Martine having a great time and then, later on, one shows her leaning on Farouk with her arm around him, looking as though she might be a bit drunk. Farouk's facial expression is humourless, tight-lipped, expressionless, and his eyes are looking straight at the camera whilst he's holding the neck of a beer bottle. As the evening wore on, some of Martine's friends began to feel tired and at about 2am decided to go back to their flats. Martine wasn't ready to go home just yet and wanted to stay out and have more fun. CCTV shows Martine and Farouk leaving the club together at between 2 and 3am and getting into a taxi apparently to go to another nightclub. At the time, they were no more than a mile from the basement where a horrific discovery would be made just two days later. Meanwhile, back at her flat, Martine's housemates were beginning to become worried about where she might have gotten to. Martine had not texted in to let them know she was okay. This would have been more difficult than usual because Martine had lost her mobile phone about a week before. Even so, she could have borrowed Farouk's if she was still with him. It was expected that she keep her friends updated. It wasn't long before that worry turned to panic, and Martine's friends decided to contact both Martine and Farouk on Facebook. If Martine was with Farouk, he could ask her to call in or he could even tell them that she was alright. However, as they logged onto Facebook and clicked onto Farouk's profile, they noticed something strange. Farouk had updated his status to say home alone. This was curious because they knew Martine had left Maddox with Farouk, so where could she be if she wasn't with him? Without wasting a moment more, the friends began to call round to all of Martine's other friends to try and find her. This went on for hours, and the darkness of the evening soon turned to cold light, and the worry increased. A Facebook page was quickly set up to gather information on Martine's possible whereabouts. The group of friends went back to Maddox and handed out flyers to passers-by, as well as to any local residents asking for information. But still, they got nothing. By Saturday the 15th of March, there was still no word from or about Martine, and the group of friends were so worried that they decided it was time to call the police and report her missing. Although the police initially thought there was no cause for concern, officers were still sent to Farouk's flat at 222 Great Portland Street. It was at this point that Martine's flatmates decided to contact the Magnuson family to tell them that Martine was missing. At Great Portland Street, the police found evidence that gave them grounds to investigate further. They knocked on the door and waited, but after some time and no answer... 
they decided to check inside. They discovered that Farouk was nowhere to be seen and, on further investigation, discovered that the flat had been completely abandoned, with Farouk's phone, bag, wallet and even passport missing. The officers also found items of Martine's clothing and personal possessions scattered around the flat. Her snakeskin shoes, a Marc Jacobs handbag, a guest watch and one of a pair of Christian Dior earrings as well as her jeans, were all found inside the flat. Officers continued searching the building and one noticed a small trail of blood droplets leading away from the flat and down towards the basement. Once there, the officers tried the door but it was locked. Moments later, they used full force and smashed down the basement door. Inside, they discovered what looked like an arm sticking out of a pile of building rubble. Underneath, they confirmed, lay the body of Martine Vic Magnusson. She had been covered with building rubble in what they considered to be an attempt to hide her body. It was clear there had been a violent struggle. There were severe lacerations all over Martine's partially clothed body. Her head was covered in blood and there were marks across her neck. Martine had clearly fought hard to fight off her attacker, but had unfortunately lost that battle. Once Martine's body had been discovered, the police immediately appealed for a quote, man of Arab appearance who Martine was believed to have left the club with to come forward. No names were released at this time, but even at that early stage of the investigation, it was clear to detectives that Farouk knew he was a suspect. By the time investigators looked into his activity from the night of the murder, Farouk had already left the country. He'd boarded a flight at London Heathrow bound for Cairo, claiming that he had an urgent family business to attend. From there, it is believed Farouk travelled by his father's private jet to Sana'a, Yemen's capital, They also discovered that he had erased his Facebook page. Meanwhile, Martine's family had flown into London the following day, Sunday. They were met at the airport by detectives from Scotland Yard and were taken straight to the police station and asked to wait in a room. In that room, in a foreign country, the family were told that a body, found in the basement of 222 Great Portland Place, was believed to be that of Martine their dear daughter and sister. Next door to Martine's family, in a different room at the police station, Martine's friends were gathered. Once the news had been given to Martine's parents, the senior investigating officer went to see them and gave them the same grave news. They could not believe what they had heard. Some broke down and some were in disbelief. For the Magnusons, The next few days, weeks, months and years would be traumatic. Initially, they were taken to the Grosvenor Hotel and on the following Tuesday, Odd Petter went to identify his daughter's body. He was warned he might notice bruising on her face. There was discoloration of her skin across the bridge of her nose caused by attempts to fight off the rapist. Odd Petter said that when he saw her, quote, she still had eyeshadow on and still looked very much like herself, unquote. He gently stroked her cheek with his fingers. Farouk remained the main and only suspect. In the first few days of the inquiry, codenamed Operation De Bruce, it soon became apparent to Detective Chief Inspector Jessica Wadsworth of the Homicide and Serious Crime Command Unit, that the evidence all pointed in one direction. Quote, Very quickly, we knew who we wanted to speak to. DCI Jessica Wadsworth spoke to Farouk's father over the telephone. Quote, He, at that time, claimed to have no knowledge of his son's whereabouts. He said he would contact his lawyers and they would get in touch. And that's the last communication we had with him. Unquote. Just over a week after the murder, on Sunday the 23rd of March, 
It was reported that Farouk had appeared at the offices of his lawyer, seeking legal assistance. Later, the lawyer would say that Farouk could be questioned by British authorities as long as it took place in Yemen. On the 30th of March, Farouk was publicly named as a suspect by the Metropolitan Police and listed as wanted on Scotland Yard's website. In Yemen, the local newspapers printed a statement issued by Farouk's uncle through a third party, in which it was said that they would not associate themselves with any member of the family connected with any wrongdoing. The problem for British police was that without an extradition treaty with Yemen, it would require diplomatic cooperation for officers from Scotland Yard to travel to Yemen to question Farouk. They could not hold any trial in Yemen, as under Yemeni law, if found guilty, the sentence could result in the death penalty which still existed in Yemeni law. In any case, Yemeni culture dictated that justice is a family affair rather than a matter for the state. Farouk could be sheltered for months, even years, as long as his family had the funds to maintain him. Meanwhile, back in the UK, the coroner's inquest was happening at Westminster's Coroner Court. The forensic pathologist, Dr Nathaniel Carey, reported that the victim of the attack had sustained 43 substantial injuries to her head, neck and body. Toxicology tests confirmed she had consumed 130 milligrams of alcohol and a small amount of cocaine, but this could be considered consistent with any weekend drinker and recreational user. It was clear that Martine had been conscious at the time she was raped. The mark across her neck that had been of particular note for the police when she was found was consistent with compression. She had been pinned down to the floor by an object, a hand or a foot, the inquest heard, and then strangled with abrasions found across her head, neck and face, as well as her body which were inflicted as she fought off an attacker. The local Arab media in Yemen failed to report that the son of one of the country's richest men, Shahir Abdullah, was wanted for questioning regarding the death of Martine. Shahir then consulted London-based law firm Peter & Peters, experts in extradition law. They would be called on extensively by the Abdulok family in the coming years. He also engaged David Wilson, the managing director of the public relations firm Bell Pottinger, to act as his spokesperson in the UK. And on Thursday the 20th of March, a week after Martine's disappearance, Shahir Abdulok met Yemen's interior minister, Rashad al-Alimi, to ensure that his son would not be handed over to British authorities or police. Despite the fact Farouk had fled back to his homeland and was protected by his family, attempts to get him to return to the UK for trial, either voluntarily or through legal extradition, had continued. The British police sent their evidence to the Crown Prosecution Service, which, once it had been reviewed, provided sufficient evidence to prosecute Farouk for Martin's murder. A European arrest warrant was issued for Farouk. In December 2008, an extradition request was sent to Yemen, but by the next February, it had been formally denied by Yemen. By 2010, Farouk had still not been questioned by the police, and the senior detective in the case, DCI Jessica Wadsworth, said, quote, It's just that awful feeling that injustice prevails. We will pursue and pursue and pursue. I understand that he continues to protest his innocence. Well, if you're innocent, then come back. You've got nothing to fear. Unquote. It was reported that DCI Jessica Wadsworth still had, quote, an outside hope that Farouk's family would hand him over, or that he would tire of the restrictive Islamic lifestyle and start hankering after more Western lifestyle practices that are only available outside Yemen. Various initiatives were taken by the police in the following years to get Farouk to return to the UK. And then in March 2012, Farouk's legal representatives made contact with the British authorities to seek clarification on such issues as prison conditions and a possible reduction in any sentence following a voluntary return to the UK. 
but after the initial contact, nothing happened. Then, a year later, they made contact again to discuss a plan for two face-to-face meetings, raising hopes that Farouk might be returned to the UK for trial. It was suggested that a third meeting might be arranged should the first two go well, but yet again, the meetings did not happen. It was soon realised that this activity was simply a delay tactic, and that there was probably never any intention by Shahir Abdullah, who was behind the suggestions for the meetings, of returning his son to the UK. In 2014, British police made an unprecedented Facebook appeal in Yemen, launched by Scotland Yard, aimed at Farouk and his family, explaining the legal status of Farouk as an internationally wanted person. Marking the 8th anniversary of Martin's murder, the UK Foreign Office and Scotland Yard both issued calls for Farouk's return to the UK to face charges and a new appeal launched, which included publicity images from Oslo. In March 2016, DCI Andy Partridge of the Metropolitan Police Service's Homicide and Major Crime Comment again went public with an appeal for Farouk to return to the UK. Quote, This case is still very much a live investigation. Farouk Abdullah remains wanted for the rape and murder of Martin Vic Magnusson. Farouk Abdullah has known for the past eight years now that he is wanted for the rape and murder of Magnusson. There have been extensive diplomatic efforts made over this time to return him to the UK, to no avail. This anniversary should serve as a further reminder that he cannot put behind him. It will not go away, and I appeal to him and those close to him to advise him to return to the UK to stand trial. Unquote. Martin's father said, quote, In today's globalised world, you cannot hide forever from the oldest and most serious crime known to man the rape and murder of a woman. I appeal to you to return to the UK to assist the police in finding out what happened to Martine. I regard you as a coward unless you take responsibility for your actions. Unquote. On the 14th of March 2018, to mark the 10th anniversary of Martine's murder, the Metropolitan Police and the Foreign Office made fresh appeals confirming that the investigation would continue and remain active until the suspect was returned to the UK. On the 12th anniversary in 2020, police again called on Farouk to return. Quote, Over the past 12 years, Martine's family and my investigation team have kept this case in the public's thoughts, raising it again and again with each passing anniversary. It must be clear to Farouk Abdullah the person sought in connection with Martin's murder, that this matter is not going to go away and his status as a wanted man will remain. He has chosen to flee, chosen to hide, hoping this matter would go away. The actions of a coward. I would appeal for him to return to the UK to assist this investigation. It must be clear to him now, 12 years later, that the studies he embarked on in the UK, the plans he was making for his future can never be realised while this matter is unresolved. I appeal for anyone who has contact with Abdullah to make him see sense and to advise him to return to the UK. He can never have a normal life whilst remaining wanted and in hiding. Unquote. In parallel with the efforts of the police, there had also been a public movement in Norway through both the Magnusson family and the Foundation for Justice for Martin, seeking to publicise the case and put pressure on politicians to act to challenge Yemen to extradite Farouk. Back in March 2009, Martin's father complained about the lack of help he had received in pursuing justice for Martin from the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. The case was debated in the Norwegian Parliament, and whilst the Foreign Minister claimed to have done everything possible in the case, the Minister stated that the government would contact the family only if and when there were new developments. In July of that year, a complaint about lack of action was filed with the Norwegian Committee of Foreign Affairs by a supporter of the case, Mr A. Tollesfen. In October, Martin's father wrote an article in Aftenposten outlining the need for Norwegian authorities to act decisively in the case. 
The foreign minister replied in the paper, defending the position of the Norwegian government. But Martin's father countered this by demanding further, more far-reaching action. In December that same year, between 1,000 and 2,000 people held a torchlight parade for Martin, demanding more action from the Norwegian government to get Farouk extradited. And there was wide coverage in both the British and Norwegian press, with the British Sunday Telegraph making a special trip to Oslo to follow the case. The then Foreign Minister, Yunus Gustora, who had been criticised for not doing enough to get Farouk extradited, met Martin's friends, who delivered a 27,000 signature petition. The group demanded that the Norwegian authorities apply greater political pressure on the Yemenis to get a possible solution to the case. The US even became involved because Farouk held American citizenship. The Justice for Martin group planned to meet officials of the US Foreign Ministry and they agreed that the Martin case would be raised in any meetings with British, Yemeni and American authorities. At the same time, the British police reiterated in public press briefings that the case is still ongoing and that they were hoping progress would be made with the extradition. The next year, in January, a Norwegian businessman filed a legal complaint in a Norwegian court against Shahir Abdulok, claiming he assisted Farouk to escape to Yemen after the murder and also claiming damages for the flatmates of Martine and the psychological effect on them because of her murder. For the first time... The Norwegian Foreign Minister Yunus Gustora met Yemeni Energy Minister and Yemen's ambassador to the United Arab Emirates. During the meeting, the murder of Martin was discussed. In the same month, the minister confirmed in an article in Aftenposten that the American authorities were, at this point, now involved in the case, and the US Foreign Secretary addressed the matter during the meeting in London. During 2010, The case was constantly in the media, but almost two years on from the murder, there was still no progress. In June, Martin's family hosted a remembrance event at Regent's College. They unveiled a tree planted in her memory, and Martin's father paid tribute to the Metropolitan Police. He said that he found the whole process slow and frustrating, but that he had nothing but praise for Scotland Yard and the British authorities. He added that it was extremely critical to note that Norway had done so little to put pressure on Yemen. And at this stage, he also focused on campaigning to change the law that allows someone to simply walk away from a crime of rape and murder. In December of 2010, politicians from all sides of the Storting, the Norwegian Parliament and the Supreme Arena for Political Debate and Decision Making wrote to large multinationals who did trade with the Shahir trading company, such as Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, Philips and Whirlpool, asking them to assess their links with Abdulok companies. These letters were written in collaboration with Martin's father and asked all of the companies to inform Abdulok about this case and asked that they consider whether it was in accordance with their ethical standard to have business relations with someone who prevents British police in an ongoing murder investigation. It was later discovered that Shahir was involved with arms trading, including selling 25,000 machine guns and 12 million rounds of ammunition to Islamic resistance movement Hamas. This resulted in a boycott against Shahir, led by Martin's father and Sterla Ellingvag. Mercedes-Benz, Philips and Whirlpool pulled out of business dealings with Shahir straight away. They understood. Coca-Cola didn't at first, but eventually they pulled out too. There's actually a brilliant TED talk by Sterla Ellingvag on how he helped convince 53,000 people to boycott Shahir-associated companies. I'll leave a link in the show notes. A year later... Martin's father presented a proposal to the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on new international legislation to fill the international legal vacuum that the Martin case had highlighted. The resolution, Transnational Fugitive Offenders, built on Martin's case, was presented to the Organisation for Security 
and cooperation in Europe, and later signed by 58 countries. In October of 2014, the Martin Foundation made and launched a video, Is This Fair?, in both Arabic and English, exploring the legal aspects of the case, sponsored by a Norwegian company. In June of 2015, a concert was held featuring well-known Norwegian artists to celebrate Thomas Seberg's launch of a song called The Call, in memory of Martine. In August 2017, Norwegian parliamentarians forwarded a formal letter to the suspect's parents appealing for justice in the Martine case. In March 2018, flowers were still being placed at Martine's memorial tree in Regent's University and at the entrance of the flat in Great Portland Street where Martine was found in 2008. At the 10th anniversary of Martine's murder, the chairman of the Martine Foundation for Justice suggested meeting Abdulok at any place of his choosing. His proposal was made in English and in Norwegian and was published in Aftenposten, Norway's leading newspaper, but no response was ever received. He and Martin's father also met ministers, Scotland Yard and the media for a 45-minute press conference about the continuing case. Scotland Yard made public for the first time CCTV footage showing Martine and Farouk leaving the Maddox nightclub prior to the murder together, with further footage showing Farouk leaving the UK the following morning. In May of the same year, another civil lawsuit for damages was filed in the UK against Farouk Abdullah by all members of the Magnuson family. So far, these efforts have failed to bring Farouk to the UK for questioning. In fact, Farouk is free in Yemen and is now married. He is living out his life freely, unlike Martine. Odd Petter Magnusson summed up the situation in an interview he gave to the Guardian newspaper. Quote, This is not a question of lack of extradition treaties. It's a simple matter of right and wrong. This has nothing to do with moral obligation. People are dying every day throughout the world, but what makes this tragedy challenging to us is that this is not a natural catastrophe. This particular tragedy, in this case, comes from the worst motivation a human can have, to kill a person, to put yourself as judge over their life, to take that life away because it suits you. This is beyond excuse. That is beyond comprehension. And he can just lie by the pool in Yemen and live happily ever after. What sort of a father would I be if I didn't do everything I could to prevent this happening to other children? Red Rum is written and presented by Grace Cordell. It's produced by Russ Clark and Grace Cordell. Music and sound design by Russ Clark. Title music by Benjamin James.